During the April 8th, 2024 eclipse, my wife and I were dead center of totality in eastern New Brunswick, where the sky, by some miraculous fluke of incredibly good luck, had become crystal clear only about an hour and a half before the eclipse happened. But due to a perfect confluence of circumstances, I think I caught, very much by happy accident, what may well be some of the best videography of shadow bands that has ever been recorded. Shadow bands are phenomena that occur in the moments before and after totality. And from what I've read, they can last anywhere from a few seconds to a minute or two. However, in our case, we experienced shadow bands for approximately 40 seconds before totality and after. They are very low contrast phenomena, and the human eye is much better at catching contrast than a camera is. So even though I was using a very high-end camera, a Fuji X-T3 with a fast lens and a good size APS-C sensor, the larger the sensor, the better a camera can capture dynamic range, hence subtle shades of contrast. What the camera portrays here is nothing like we actually experienced in the moment there. For us, it was as if we were bathed in the shadow bands. The forest, the landscape, the break, they washed right over us. There were amazing racing shadows that seemed to run like courtiers before the eclipse and after. And I have to admit, ever since I have become fascinated by them. So I've been poring over resources, trying to gain an understanding of their cause. And do you know, even though we are now in the third decade of the 21st century, the exact cause of shadow bands is still not entirely clear. There are a number of competing theories. But, as I poured over various papers, two really stood out. One, as very thorough, and it certainly explained a lot of what we saw. However, the other was just as well researched, but only added to the mystery. First of all, let's talk about what shadow bands are, and their nature. Here I've changed the composite mode to luminosity and switched the view to negative. I've also slowed the video speed down to one half, for 30 frames per second. This will allow us to see the shadow bands a little more clearly. What we know about shadow bands to date is that they are the result of a confluence of circumstances coming together just right in the moments before and after an eclipse to create waves of light and shadow insofar as they appear to the human eye. Their speed of recorded movement varies, but according to the papers that I came across, it is generally accepted as about 1.8 meters per second. Now, I did a rough timing of these shadow bands, in which I cut the speed down to 10% so that I could see their movements across the landscape even better. I'll switch to that video now. And in this video, I also changed the video clip back to no composites or normal composite, but I greatly amped up the contrast in this video specific to the ranges of light in which the shadow bands appeared. Now, to be honest, I was so mesmerized by the beauty of the shadow bands that I didn't think to do any scientific measurements when I was there. So I didn't lay out any precise markers, but what I did was, based on memory of the area, I estimated a space that I thought to be just about two meters apart. There, and there. Then I observed for a shadow band to come into the range of one of the marker points, and then stepped frame by frame, tracing the shadow band's movement from point A to point B, counting the total number of frames it took one of the shadow bands to move. Three counts of three different shadow bands average between 56 and 84 frames. And this works out pretty close to the 1.8 meters per second that is the frequently estimated movement speed of shadow bands. But what are shadow bands exactly? One of the best and most thorough theoretical papers that I read was published in the Journal of Astronomy and Astrophysics all the way back in 1986, and it was written by Johannin Cadona. Johannin speculated that shadow bands are the result of effects of the atmosphere on the light coming from the sun. The effect, he speculated, is made possible as the moon moves to cover the very last sliver of the sun. Let's go ahead and create an eclipse using CGI and take a look at the creation of shadow bands according to Cadoba's theory. The theory is extremely technical and honestly outside of my bailiwick, so hopefully I interpret his theory correctly. According to his theory, atmospheric turbulence is a primary contributor to the shadow bands. However, not strictly the racing clouds like what we are seeing here. The real atmospheric contributor to shadow bands is seeing, that is the turbulence in the atmosphere that causes stars to twinkle. 
On a day when an eclipse is going to happen, the moon is going to move in front of the sun. For the vast majority of this process, we would be unaware on Earth unless we happen to be looking up toward the sun, which of course you shouldn't do with the unaided eye. And it is not until the vast majority of the sun is covered that we would begin to notice dimming on Earth. The sun is just that bright and powerful. But shadow bands will not appear until the last few moments before the moon manages to totally cover the sun. Because it is when the moon has covered that last sliver of light that the quality of the lights will become such that shadow bands can appear. The theory of why works something like this. Imagine looking up into the night sky and seeing the stars overhead. On some nights they twinkle and on other nights they don't. On those nights they twinkle, it's because there is considerable atmospheric turbulence which could begin anywhere from a couple hundred meters up to several thousand meters up. But the light that reaches Earth fundamentally swims through the atmosphere, much as the light that strikes clear water swims to the bottom of a pool where it is refracted, bent, and appears to sidle about. This effect is known as scintillation, though astrophotographers refer to the apparent twinkling of stars in the sky as the seeing. Nights of good seeing have little to no twinkling, and nights of poor seeing have a great deal of twinkling. Stars twinkle because they are infinitely small points of light. In actuality, we all know a star is huge, but even the closest star is over four light years away. The sun has a diameter of 1.4 million kilometers. One of the largest stars we know of is Betelgeuse, with a diameter of over 1.23 billion kilometers. But at such great distances, stars are, effectively, infinitely small points of light. Light entering Earth's atmosphere from infinitely small points is far more prone to the effect of scintillation or twinkling. By contrast, objects such as planets subtend or take up a bit of space in the sky. It's very small, but because they don't effectively make infinitely small points of light, they twinkle far less. And the sun and moon do not twinkle at all because they take up a considerably larger portion of the sky. So normally the sun and the moon would never appear to twinkle. But when the moon covers the sun during a solar eclipse, less and less of the sun becomes visible. In the last few moments of an eclipse, only a tiny crescent remains. That tiny crescent comes to act like a series of infinitely small points, or like a crescent of stars. And this thin sliver of light from the sun can now scintillate through the atmosphere, where atmospheric turbulence contributes to the apparent motion of shadow bands. Shadow bands, however, are difficult to see. They are very low contrast and often get lost in the environment, especially if an eclipse is viewed from an urban area on dark to gray concrete or in a rural area, such as out in a meadow, where the faint and delicate shadows of the bands can get lost among the grasses. Persons hoping to view them will often put out something like a pale sheet on the ground or even set up a board. One of the reasons I was able to capture them in video so clearly was that by sheer happy chance, we found a forest break where late season snow still persisted. And the snow looked like it had melted just a little, just enough to flatten it so that the snow laid over the landscape like a big projection screen. While shadow bands will often show up during an eclipse, often they are so faint as to go unnoticed, or barely noticed at all. And Cadona noted that there are certain circumstances that contribute to their appearance. When the sun is off the zenith, they are more intense, so they might be best viewed during an eclipse earlier or later in the day and at some latitude. Of course, it is helpful if the day is clear, but there must be atmospheric turbulence. The worse the seeing, the more contrasty and dramatic the shadow bands will be. The closer one is to dead center of the path of totality, the more intense the shadow bands will appear as well. If one experiences an eclipse from somewhere along the side of totality, the shadow bands will be fainter and appear at a perpendicular angle to the last or first crescent of the sun at the beginning or end of totality. And one will of course not see them at all if one is outside of totality. He noted the best place to see them, where the contrast will be the best, is dead center of the path of totality. There, the shadow bands, if they appear at all, will be the most obvious, the most contrasty. And the bands will be perpendicular to the path of the moon as it crosses the sun, or one might say run roughly parallel to the crescent. He also noted that areas of high humidity are not likely to show the shadow bands well. Naturally, meaning avoiding trying to view shadow bands in regions of wetlands and very often near lakes or seas.
But, as one can see from his theory, there is a considerable degree of chance in being able to observe shadow bands. One must not only have an eclipse, but a number of environmental circumstances must come together just right. That the apparent random motion of the shadow bands is the result of atmospheric turbulence, the very same kind of turbulence that creates poor seeing for astrophotographers, seems straightforward enough to me. But, what exactly is the cause of the motion of the shadow bands? They appear to flow at about 1.8 meters per second, and Cardona noted that the flow will be perpendicular to the angle of the shadow bands, and the shadow bands themselves will be parallel to the ecliptic crescent. But why do they seem to move like they do? To me, that is the most puzzling question of all. And the reality is, no one is exactly sure what causes the movement. Some theories postulate that the movement results from the flow of wind. The wind that causes the refraction that shapes the shadow bands, pushes cells of air through it, and the shadow bands that we see on the ground are the bright and dark patterns of refraction between those cells moving along with the atmospheric wind. This theory would seem viable except for the problem that, as Cadona noted, shadow bands will appear to move in the direction of the center of the crescent. And, at least according to the video that I shot of the shadow bands here, that is accurate. The time is 1638 and the eclipse can be seen just center right and above out of sight to the frame. But here's the problem. Some papers describe the shadow bands primarily as scintillating and go through a great deal of effort to describe the scintillation, the writhing of the shadow bands, which are sometimes known as shadow snakes because of that writhing. As you can see in the video that I captured, the shadow bands are not writhing. Let's switch back to the negative view for a better perspective on that. The shadow bands are not writhing, but if a straight line was drawn between the two points of a shadow band, that line would be parallel to what is visible of the crescent of the moon-covered sun. In a paper called Qualitative Shadow Band Observations from Three Sites in the Southeast, a team led by Gordon Telepun attempted to measure shadow bands from three sites separated by 176 miles, one just south of totality. Their conclusions are very interesting because they observed that the shape of the shadow bands could vary. Telepun had observed shadow bands before at a 2002 eclipse and noticed the bands had a more serpentine form. But during this eclipse, the shadow bands had a more straight or row-like form. They also observed that at one site, the shadow bands shifted their direction of movement by 30 degrees, and at another site, the shadow bands moved contrary to the path of the shadow of the moon. This led them, very reasonably, to conclude that shadow bands' shape and movement are caused by diffraction that is created by air cells within the atmosphere overhead. However, analysis of cloud movements of satellite data did not line up with the variations in the patterns of movements of the shadow bands, which led them to further conclude that the atmospheric effects that create the movement of the shadow bands happens much higher overhead, higher than the altitude that clouds appear. It would appear that the shadow bands are the result of a number of effects coming together. They happen when a solar eclipse reduces the sun down to the slightest sliver, when atmospheric seeing is very poor. The sky, however, is clear and they can best be seen when the sun is low during an eclipse. And to really see them well, you need a pale surface, such as a field of level new snow. Still, these are all only theories, and there is room for new developments. Shadow bands are one of those things that, the study of which are unlikely to ever yield any kind of profit. So I imagine research will go slowly, done by those who are fascinated, and conduct science for its own sake.